Hi, rock stars. I hope you're having a fabulous August. Um, I am excited that you can join me today. And for those of you who are watching this replay later, happy whatever month you are happen to be watching this in. Um, so today we are going to be talking about conferences. And I wanted to talk about this in August, most uh, mostly because the fall conference season is upon us. Um, this is useful information and advice for any time of year, but since a lot of you are gearing up for the fall conference season, I thought this would be some kind of good timing here. So I'm gonna attempt to share my screen, and for some reason, Crowdcast has changed their interface a little bit. So I'm hoping this works. If it doesn't, let me know in the chat room um, on the, the side of your screen, and hopefully I'll be able to fix that. So let's see here. And use full screen. Okay, so this should be working. So as I said, today we're gonna to be talking about navigating academic conferences. The information will be useful for navigating conferences of a, of a variety of sorts. And I'll talk about industry and activist and artist conferences as well. But since a lot of you, particularly with the fall conference season, are gearing up for academic conferences as interdisciplinary and multimedia as they might be, um, I wanted to focus specifically on that. So what are we gonna talk about today? What's on the agenda? I wanna start talking off, uh, I wanna start off talking about why should you attend conferences at all? Oftentimes in academia, that is just an assumptive given. It's just assumed that you'll attend conferences, but often we don't stop to think about why we want to, why we should, and what we can get out of attending conferences. So I wanna start there. I'll also talk about how to decide which conferences to attend. There's a million conferences out there, many of which are amazing and fabulous and can teach you all kinds of things and put you in contact with some really amazing people. And obviously we have limits on our time and our budgets, and so we can't attend them at all. Uh, uh, we can't attend them all. So I'm gonna talk about how you decide for your individual situation, which ones to attend. I also wanna talk about building community through conferences, which is really the purpose of conferences themselves. I'll also spend a good chunk of time talking about accessibility, how to manage, how to identify, and then how to manage your energy levels, the spaces or environments of a given conference, as well as the relationships or interactions that you might encounter there. I'll also cover how to present and how to get productive feedback. Now, this isn't a webinar just about conference presentations. That could be a webinar in and of itself. Perhaps we'll do one of those um, in, the, in the coming months. But I do wanna talk about it a little bit, particularly in the context of deciding which conferences are gonna be useful for you and your individual goals and what you want out of them. And then also how to manage them and set up your presentations so that you get the most productive, helpful feedback as possible given what you're wanting to get out of that conference. And then finally, a big topic that no one talks about in academia, or at least not enough people talk about, is how to actually afford conferences. Because as those of you who've been to conferences know or seen other people that you know attend conferences, conferences can get really, really expensive. So I wanna spend a good chunk of time today talking about how to avoid going broke while you're attending conferences. So let's start off with why should you attend conferences at all? As I mentioned briefly, the primary purpose of conferences is community building. They're a chance for you to get in physically in the same room as other people who are interested in the same things that you are. This is something that often we often forget about academic conferences or conferences more broadly when we start focusing on um, is my if my, is my conference paper up to snuff? Is it finished? Am I working on it the night before? How do I, you know, who am I supposed to talk to? How am I supposed to navigate those relationships? All of which we'll talk about. But I want you to kind of keep in mind the purpose of conferences themselves. The purpose is not to stress out poor graduate students. It's not to throw too much information at you and expect you to go to everything. And it's not to deplete your bank account as well as your energy levels at the same time. It's really a chance to build community, to meet new people who are, who are interested in similar things as you, and a chance to reconnect with friends and colleagues and, and freshen and maintain those relationships. One of the kind of most 
interesting and kind of weird things about academic community is oftentimes the people that we are in closest intellectual conversation with and that we are closest emotionally to don't live where we do. And this differentiates graduate school and academia more broadly from other industries or other realms of life, right? So conferences are really the main opportunity for you to reconnect with those friends, those colleagues, those intellectual interlocutors and meet new ones, right? So we'll talk about some ways to, to do that in a minute. Conferences are also an incredibly rich source of intellectual and creative inspiration, right? This might be why you've uh, primarily gone to conferences so far. You get to go to panels on topics that you want to learn more about. You get to listen to keynotes from people who are doing really interesting work. You get to go to performances or social events with folks who are doing some really creative things that can inspire you in your own work, right? Conferences are also a really great opportunity to see varied career models. Now, oftentimes the kind of boilerplate advice in in graduate school, if you get any at all about conferences, is built on an assumption that everyone will become a tenure track professor. Now, of course, as we know, the majority of people do not become tenure track professors with PhDs, and they have a variety of really exciting careers. And so conferences can actually be a really great opportunity to see different career models or different examples of what you can do with a PhD. Conferences are also a great opportunity to see a new city, right? Unless the conference is, is in the city that you live in, the place that you live in, it's a chance to travel. Sometimes conferences are in more fun places than others, for sure. But at the bare minimum, they do give you a chance to see a new location. Oftentimes, academics, particularly um, most faculty do this, actually. Graduate students are often in the process of learning to do this. You can often turn a conference trip into a kind of mini vacation. Can you add a few days on the beginning or the end that let you explore the place that the conference is in or that let you travel to a nearby place if that place is you know, more interesting? And then obviously conferences are a big site for academic job interviews. I'm not going to talk extensively about academic job interviews in this webinar today. Perhaps we can cover that in a future one. But obviously, that is a big reason why people attend conferences. OK, so how do you decide which ones to attend? Now, like many things in academia, there's no kind of one size fits all piece of advice for this. Unfortunately, I can't tell you, you must go to these five conferences or you must go to this many conferences per year. That's gonna depend on a lot of things. It's gonna depend on your career goals. It's gonna depend on your budget situation. It's gonna depend on your schedule and how much time you have to, to uh, give over to travel and to events. And it's gonna depend on the goals that you're trying to meet in a particular year or semester, right? I'm gonna encourage you to be choosy about which conferences you want to attend. And this just requires a little bit of strategy and research ahead of time. So you, you, you can think about which conferences would help you meet a specific goal. For example, if you have a goal this year, let's say you've mapped out your, your uh, academic year, you know you're gonna be working on a particular dissertation chapter, or you know that you're gonna be teaching a course on a particular topic or TAing a course on a particular topic come next semester. You might have a specific goal to learn something that will help you write that dissertation chapter, say, learn more on a specific um, research area or about a different methodology. Or you might have a goal that will help you teach that class. For example, see more examples of how syllabi work or talk with more people about um, creative student assignments. Right. If these are goals that help you uh, in your professional life, you can think about which conferences coming up will help you achieve those goals that will either provide you the information, the skill set or the networks, i.e. relationships that will help you meet those goals. You're also going to think about which conferences fit your time and your money budgets. So you're probably used to thinking about your money budgets, right? Which is good. That's an important thing to, to think about. And I will talk a lot more about money in a minute. 
And that should certainly be a concern. So which conferences can you financially afford to attend? But also think about which conferences you can afford to attend with regards to time. Some conferences last longer than others. Some of them require travel time that increases the time that you have to spend away from campus, away from your dissertation, perhaps away from your classes, more than others. So for example, if there's a conference that's happening, an international conference that's happening far away um, on the other side of the globe, that will take you a significant amount of time to travel there and back in addition to the time of the conference itself, right? So when you're making decisions about can you actually afford time-wise to go to that conference? Those are some of the things that you'd need to take into consideration. Right? You can also think about which conferences are in places that you want to visit. This is a perfectly legit way to help you decide which conferences to go to. Obviously, this isn't going to be your only criteria, right? because there are a lot of conferences in amazing places that don't really help you meet specific goals or aren't really relevant to your field or what you're trying to do in your life. But chances are there are some conferences that do help you with those professional goals that are in some better or more interesting places than others, right? So it's one thing you can take into consideration. You can also think about um, which conferences are going to be best for these things doesn't necessarily rely on the conference size. So oftentimes, particularly um, with early, uh, early year graduate students, so graduate students in their first few years of graduate school, since you're still kind of getting a feel for the different scholarly associations that exist and the different conferences that exist, much less trying to figure out which ones to go to, sometimes you might be tempted to just go to the biggest one that you hear of. Right? It's the one that's on everyone's lips. It's the one that keeps getting talked about. And you might think, well, I should just go to that one because I don't really know many others. That conference might be a good fit for you, but I want to encourage you to not assume that it necessarily will be. Sometimes small conferences can be amazing and actually a lot more helpful professionally than the giant conferences. And there are reasons for this. Giant conferences give you more stuff, more people, and more topics. But that also means you often have less time to focus on any one individual thing. With more people, it means the chance of you actually meeting and having sub substantive conversations with any individual person, for example, a scholar that you wanted to meet that you admire, the chances of you actually getting face time with them is smaller at a big conference than at a small conference. At a small conference where there are fewer people there, that big academic rock star that you're super excited to talk uh, that you're super excited to talk to, you have actually a better chance of actually conversing with them. So yes, big conferences can be fantastic. Yes, small conferences can also be fantastic. Size doesn't necessarily correspond to uh, the quality of the conference itself. So what are some of the types of conferences that you get to choose between? There are starting going from kind of well starting with the with the biggest one we can think about giant professional association meetings. These are conferences put on annually every single year by the giant academic associations. So you can think of, for example, the Modern Language Association conference. It's huge, right? We're talking multiple thousands of people, hundreds of sessions, hundreds of concurrent sessions. You can't physically go to everything you're not supposed to, right? The International Communication Association is another example of this. The American Studies Association. Um, these are giant professional association meetings, right? You also can think about mid-sized professional association meetings. So these are similar in the sense that they're run by academic professional associations, but the size of the conferences and the size of the associations themselves are kind of mid-range. Right, so you think, can think, for example, um, about the National Women's Studies Association, a kind of mid-sized professional association conference, or the Cultural Studies Association, right? Um, the Critical Ethnic Studies Association. We're talking a few hundred as opposed to a few thousand or tens of thousands of people at the conference itself. 
Also super fun are activists and arts conferences. For example, the Ad Life Media Conference that some of you uh, might have attended or the Creating Change Conference that I think that I've talked with some of you about. Um, these can be really inspirational and really helpful for finding networks and building community with people interested in the same kind of scholarly, artistic and activist um, interest that you have. You can also think about industry conferences. For example, South by Southwest, uh, 99U, which is a conference in New York about design and kind of create the creative industries that has a lot of integration with academia in various ways. The Work It Women's Podcasting Conference, which is coming up in October, which is going to be fantastic. Um, that's in Anaheim. So these are conferences that are focused on a specific industry or field that aren't necessarily solely academic conferences, right? But can be useful for you in academia or not, or outside of academia, right? Um, you also have the choice to think about uh, topic specific conferences. So these are conferences that are organized around a particular theme or, or topic. Now these can be either one off conferences, like a single conference about X topic, right? It's, you know, the topic is timely, a campus got together enough funding to put on a single conference about it. Or they can be annual conferences, but they're still organized around a specific topic or theme rather than a specific organization. So for example, QGCon, which is a queer games conference that some of you might be familiar with, is a good example of this, or the Beyond the Professoriate conference that happens every year in the spring, another example of this. And then finally, you can think about graduate student conferences. So some that you might've heard of, the Thinking Gender Conference held at UCLA every year, or the Gender Studies Symposium held at uh, Lewis and Clark College um, every year. So these are annual, conferences. Obviously, there are graduate student conferences that are not, but the two examples I gave you are annual conferences, but they're specifically to highlight the work of graduate students. Now, you might ask, why would I go to a graduate student conference when I could go to um, uh, a conference that isn't just for graduate students? If you're early in your graduate student career or early in your presentation career, so you haven't given many presentations, Graduate student conferences can be fantastic. They're a great chance for you to learn the ropes, to kind of get a sense of what presenting and what conferences are like before going to giant professional associations with tens of thousands of people, right? Okay. So then once you've decided which conferences to actually go to, you've figured out what works for your, your time and your, your uh, financial budgets, what do you actually do when you're there, right? As I mentioned, the primary purpose of conferences, regardless of industry, regardless of field, regardless of size, is to build community. Conferences are first and foremost social gatherings. Now, don't let this freak you out if you're an introvert. I happen to be an introvert myself, and I will talk a lot about how to manage energy levels uh, and, and sociality at conferences. But keeping in mind that conferences are about relationships, are about community, are about sociality, will help you understand a little bit about how they work and why they work the way they do. So I encourage you to decide ahead of time before you get to the conference who you want to meet up with and how much energy you have to do that. Here's a really big tip that a lot of graduate students only learn after they become faculty members, you are not expected to attend everything at a conference. It's assumed you will not attend everything. When I learned that, and I learned it when I became a, a faculty member after I spent many years in graduate school thinking that I had to attend everything, when I finally learned that, it blew my mind. And it made my life so much easier you are not expected to attend everything at a conference. Indeed, it's assumed you will not. And that's one reason why conference schedules are so darn packed. One of the other reasons is sometimes people are, are poor conference planners, but let's assume that most aren't because most are not. Um, but that's one reason why conference schedules are so packed because no one's assuming that you're gonna go to everything. They're assuming that you're gonna pick and choose between things and create your own schedule for what you're going to attend during the conference. 
So when you're deciding ahead of time who you want to meet up with at the conference and you're thinking long and hard and honestly about how much energy you have to do that, you can think about whether you can combine any of those goals or any of those, excuse me, any of those meetings. For example, let's say you're going to a conference that you have coming up in a month or so, and you've identified five people that you know you want to meet up with in some capacity. Maybe one is, you know, a really good friend of yours, but lives on the other side of the country because they're in another program. Maybe one is um, a, a senior scholar in your field that you want to connect with and you want to talk with about something relevant to your research. Maybe one is someone that you're co-organizing something with or co-editing something with and so on and so forth, right? Think about whether you can combine any of those meetups. Is there kind of, is there a way that you can have some of those people meet with you at the same time? Now, obviously this won't always be possible, but for instance, if you definitely know you wanna hang out with your graduate student cohort and you wanna hang out with that friend of yours who lives across the, across the country, can those things happen at the same time? Could you invite your cross country friend to your grad school cohort, cohort hangout? Now, this may or may not be cool with your grad student your, your cohort and you would check with them, right? But if there's possibility for combining things, it cuts down on the amount of time that you're actually spending doing all of these things, right? Because there's a limited number of hours in the day. Other kinds of events at conferences to think about are obviously the, plan the panels, the plenaries, and the keynotes. Now, oftentimes graduate students assume that they have to go to all of these. Again, no, 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 you do not. You get to pick and choose which of the panels, plenaries, and keynotes you want to attend. You can also, but how do you decide that, right? I want you to think about which of those events you want to attend, you have an active desire to attend, either because you find the topic interesting and you wanna learn something about it, you wanna keep up on new research in this field, or the people involved are people that you wanna connect with. So that's the things that you want to attend. You can also think about the things that you need to attend, right? If only all of our, our work in our professional realms was guided by our individual desires. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Sometimes there are obligations we have or responsibilities that we have. And so there are people that we need to meet up with at a given conference, or there are plenaries or keynotes that we need to attend to show support for our graduate program, for a particular field, for that individual person, et cetera. So which events do you need to attend? And then which events can you actually attend physically, right? Think about where those events are being held. Are they in a place that's accessible to you? Are they, in, are they happening at a time in which you're gonna have energy to attend? If you, for example, are more of a morning person and you're going to a conference with a lot of events that happen super late at night, you can think about whether those events, those late night events, are really the best use of your time, right? If you don't have much energy late at night, like me. So you're gonna weigh the topics, the speakers, the audiences, the locations, and the schedule of those events to figure out and to choose which ones are gonna be most useful for you given your individual situation. Now, obviously conferences don't just have panels, plenaries, and keynotes, right? They also have a large number of social events. And I wanna break this down a little bit further in to think about how, think about the role of official social events, unofficial social events, and events that you set up at conferences. So official social events at conferences would be things that are in the program. Right? So these are things like receptions or mixers, um, scheduled performances that are in the program. Sometimes conferences have art shows, things like that. Plenaries, obviously, featuring specific speakers. Or organized in the program lunches and dinners, or breakfasts for that matter, or teas, or, co or coffee breaks, or anything like that. But this is official stuff that the organizers of the conference put together and told you about. Unofficial social events would be things like parties that people throw, meetups, 
or any kind of unofficial receptions. Oftentimes, um, university departments or organizations or, um, or interest groups or even just groups of friends will organize a kind of unofficial reception, maybe at a local coffee shop, maybe at a local restaurant or a local bar. And it's not in the program, so it's not organized by the conference organizers. But they're often open to either anyone who wants to attend or anyone who's within a certain category. For example, um, you know, uh, unofficial reception for new graduate students or junior faculty or something like that, right? And then obviously there's the social events that you yourself orchestrate. So this might be coffee or drinks or meals with friends or colleagues. This might be informational interviews that you do where you're talking to people to learn about their careers about how they spend their days at their job to figure out your own career situation, and conversations with people that you admire, that you want to meet or learn something from, right? All of these, both the kind of panels, plenaries, keynotes category, and then the social event categories, all of these are part of the overall community building that you're doing at the conference, right? And because they all take time, and they all take energy, and they often take money, not always, Right, some of them take more money than others. They're things that you get to decide between when you're creating your individual schedule for the conference. And just a bit of a note before we move on for this community uh, uh, slide, I wanna talk a little bit about interacting with professors. So often graduate students don't talk to professors at conferences. It's mostly out of fear or intimidation, or you feel a little nervous, or like you're not quite sure how you're supposed to or what you're supposed to say, right? But I do encourage you to, in a professional, polite, respectful manner, talk to professors. There's a reason why academic conferences are not split between faculty and graduate students. There are not faculty-only conferences. There are conferences that more faculty attend Right. But there's a there, there's a reason why it's integrated. Right. Talk to professors, the ones that you want to. Don't just talk to random professors for the sake of talking to them. That's silly. Um, contributing something specific to their work or about some topic that you both hold in common can be a really great way to start to build a relationship. But also keep in mind that professors are largely at conferences to hang out with their friends and do service work. Right. By the time you get to be a faculty member, if that is the career that you end up pursuing, you wind up uh, your kind of friend group and your colleague group is scattered all over the world. And so conferences are the primary way that professors keep in contact with their friends. So if you notice that, you know, a, a, a senior scholar or even a junior scholar whose work you admire is doing a lot of hanging out with their friends at a conference and you don't quite know how to approach them or you're looking for an opening and don't quite find one, that's why. They're not deliberately ignoring you and they're not necessarily against you talking to them at all. It's just that they're really excited to see their friends, some of whom they only see once or once a year or every few years, right? Okay. So how do you then actually manage the energy spaces and relationships that are involved in a conference? I include all of this under the under the kind of umbrella of accessibility, right? And just to reiterate, you do not, do not, do not need to attend everything. No one will notice if you do not. No one is tracking what events you go to. No one is marking down whether you went to the reception or not. No one is, is taking attendance at the plenary. Do what you need to do at any conference to stay happy and healthy, right? That means identifying your needs and your boundaries. What are your energy levels, for example? And how do your energy levels change in different spaces over the, the course of a day or in different interactions? This requires knowing yourself a little bit. And if you don't know the answers to these things yet, you can start to learn those things, right? For example, I'm, I'm a morning person. I do great at morning events. My mind is sharp. I'm much more social. I'm much more likely to have a productive, intelligent conversation with someone at 8, 9, 10 a.m. than I am at 4, 5, or 6 p.m. 
I know that about myself. I've tracked that over years, right? So I know that I'm not gonna schedule a bunch of social events for the evening. I'm just not gonna perform very well at them. And they're not gonna make me feel good. There are exceptions to that, obviously. For example, if there's a reception I really want to go to or a plenary that for some terrible reason is scheduled at 5 p.m., please stop doing that, conference organizers. Um, I never do that when I organize conferences and I strongly discourage everyone else from doing that. Everyone is exhausted by 5 p.m. on a conference day. But anyway, um, you can also think about what environments or what movement or food needs that you have. For example, um, food is a big kind of issue, uh, accessibility issue at conferences. Sometimes conference organizers are great about that. They have been very thoughtful about providing food or providing information as to where you can get food. They've been holistic and inclusive about the types of food that they either provide or that they show you how to obtain if you have to get it yourself, right? Sometimes they put a list of uh, uh, local restaurants, you know, with a variety of dietary options in there, but not every conference organizer is so thoughtful. So sometimes you're gonna to need to identify the various kinds of um, food that you need access to and where you can obtain it. No, you shouldn't have to do that for yourself, but unfortunately we often do. <laughs> you can also think about what kinds of interactions um, build you up and which kind of interactions are draining to you. So for example, do big group situations, big group interactions like at receptions, do those build you up? Do those give you energy or do they zap your energy? Either one, not one is not better than the other, but it should tell you something about how you can decide which events you're gonna attend, how many of them, and then you can plan a schedule accordingly. For example, if you know that big uh, kind of reception type events where you're doing a lot of small talk with people you don't already know, if you know that those zap your energy, Maybe you don't go to every single reception. Maybe you identify the ones that are most helpful for you. You go to those, you enjoy yourself, you spend the energy there, and then you, res and then you don't go to the other ones that are less useful. Right? On the other hand, if you get really excited and inspired and energetic by receptions, go to all the receptions that would provide that for you. Right? It's about identifying what do you individually need and then what are your boundaries? All of this is adding to my number one piece of advice regarding anything about conferences, which is plan your schedule ahead of time. Now, this isn't the schedule, this isn't the program schedule, right? Program schedule very helpfully tells you when stuff is happening and what that stuff is, and hopefully where, and who's involved, right? This panel is happening at this time in this place with these people. This reception is happening here with these people when, right? I'm talking about your individual schedule. You can write this down. I'm a big fan of writing it down. You can also keep it in your head if that's where you prefer. You can put it on your phone, you can put it on your computer, you can put it in your calendar if you want, right? But think about which events you want to, you need to, and you can attend at the conference. Which people do you want to or need to meet up with? And then which people can you meet up with? and create yourself a little conf mini conference schedule that's personalized. I also encourage you to identify a recovery place somewhere that you can access during the conference. This might be your hotel room, right? It might, if that's, if that's nearby, it might be a corner somewhere <laughs> if the, the place that you're staying happens to be far away from the, from the um, event venue. It might be a, an unused classroom that you can duck into, right? To kind of regroup. But a recovery place is literally just a physical location that you can go to at any time during the conference if you just need a little break for whatever reason, right? Maybe you need to eat a granola bar because the conference is mean and didn't provide you any food and you're starving and your blood sugar is tanking, right? Maybe you need to um, check your phone messages. Maybe you need to check your email. Maybe you just want to check social media because you just need a break from one-on-one, -on -one you know, uh, in-person socializing. Whatever you need, 
See if you can identify a, a physical location that you can access during the conference that you can go to whenever you need a little bit of space. Okay. Presentations and feedback. Obviously one of the big reasons people go to conferences in addition to community building or as a method of community building, I would say, is to give conference presentations and to get feedback on your work. The number one piece of advice I have for this is probably something that you've heard before, but there's a reason why it constantly gets repeated. And that reason is because it's constantly violated. Time your presentation ahead of time and stay within your allotted time. In other words, don't be a jerk. Going over your allotted time, yes, makes you a jerk because you're infringing on other people's time, right? And that's not fair. Think about how you feel when that happens to you. It's not very nice, right? And the way that you can avoid doing that is to time your presentation ahead of time. Make sure that you're slowing down when you're presenting. When oftentimes when we speak in public, whether you are working from um, a, a paper or a script or whether you're winging it, we tend to talk faster when we're nervous. So slow down, breathe through your whole body, and use that slow down speech to time your presentation. That will help you stay within time. Also make sure to look up from your paper once in a while to make eye contact with your audience. The, the whole reason why we present in person at conferences rather than just publish things is that the interaction is important. Otherwise you can just publish your conference paper and somebody can read it. There's no reason for you to physically be in the room or for them to physically be in the room, right? The live presentation, the interactivity part of it is the entire purpose of panels, right? Otherwise we would just read each other's written stuff. So use that, slow down, make eye contact and converse with your audience. If you're using slides, you don't have to obviously, but for some fields, people use slides, make sure you verbally describe any visuals that you're presenting. This is important both for accessibility issues, so for people who can't see the screen for whatever reason, either because they're behind a tall person in front of them and they can't see the screen, or because they can't, or because they're blind or visually impaired. Verbally describe any visuals that you're showing. As well as make sure you put your full name and where people can find you online on your first and your last slide. This is, a, this is a little kind of tip that helps you build community. Remember that not everybody has their program in front of you. So not everybody is gonna remember your name, which is fine, right? They don't know you yet. Give them a chance to. Remind them what your full name is and then give them a way to contact you. So where, um, where can people find you online? If you have a professional website, put that on there. If you have a public Twitter account or Instagram account that you want to connect with colleagues through, put that on there. Obviously, if you don't use that for professional purposes, like if you have a private personal Facebook page that you don't use in a professional manner, don't put that on there. That doesn't make any sense. But give people a way to contact you. And putting that on your first slide and on your last slide means that it'll stay up there longer than any of your other slides. And depending on when you are in the panel lineup, it might stay up there during the Q&A, in which case people are gonna be staring at that longer than they're gonna be staring at anything else. So when you say that really brilliant thing, they can write down your contact info so they can contact you later and tell you how brilliant it was. Another thing to think about with presentations is to tell people at the beginning of your presentation whether they have your consent to live tweet it or live post it. Now, obviously this is up to whether people follow this is up to their own ethics. We hope that they do um, do that yourself. If you, uh, if, when you are in the audience, if somebody tells you, please don't live tweet my presentation, don't be a jerk and live tweet it. That's not cool. But tell people whether they can or not. Oftentimes audience members will just assume it's fine. But if you, for some reason, don't want uh, somebody to live tweet or live post your, uh, your presentation, just tell them. Most people will be perfectly respectful of that. As for feedback, 
when you get to the kind of end of your presentation or even scattered throughout, depending on, on the content of what you're talking about, ask the audience for what you need. If you're working on a piece and you know that there are you have questions about a specific topic or you're still developing a particular idea or you're not quite sure if this example works, tell them, tell your audience, ask for their feedback on those specific things, right? That's the entire reason why you're presenting live and in person is to get that feedback. So tell them how they can help you. You can also pose questions. For example, if you don't know something yet, you can pose questions about it. You can also make connections between the presentations. The best panels or the best kind of group presentations aren't isolated individual papers. They're integrated. They speak to each other. Hopefully the conference organizers were able to make a theme that draws your various presentations together and hopefully they explained what that theme is or those connections are, but it's also your job as a panelist to strengthen those connections, to comment on those connections, to question those connections maybe, if that's the, the uh, if that is indeed a question that you have, right? But talk about your paper in relationship to other people's paper, right, or presentation. When you're fielding questions from the audience, be generous. Assume that they're being generous too. Obviously not everyone asking a question is super nice and supportive. I wish that were the case, but unfortunately it's not. But most people are. Most people are not asking a question to be a jerk. Most of the time they're not challenging you. They're genuinely asking you something, right? On the other hand, if someone is definitely being a jerk and you can usually feel the room react to that, Right? You see a lot of side eye from a lot of people in the room. You'll see a lot of, of kind of nervous moving or face, you know, kind of faces that people make. If that's the case, then obviously you don't have to be as generous with them as you would be for someone who's not asking a jerky question. But most people are asking genuine questions. And it's perfectly okay to say that you don't know the answer to something. Oftentimes graduate students, particularly if they're if they haven't presented much, um, will stumble around and try to come up with some answer. It's a lot more enjoyable for the audience and for you, frankly, to say, you know what, that's a really great question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take some time to look that up. Or that's a really great connection with this author I've never heard of. I'm gonna track down some of their work. It's okay to admit you don't know things rather than stumble around and come up with an answer that either doesn't make any sense or is just plain wrong, right? Again, conferences are about sociality, or about feedback, or about community, and that's part of how you build it. One way you can do that, for instance, if someone asks you, well, how does your paper connect with this author that you've never heard of, or this topic you've never heard of, or this event that you've never heard of? You can turn that into an opportunity for connection oh, that's a really interesting connection. That sounds really fascinating. I don't know much about that event, author, or topic. What do you think about some of these, some of these connections? So then you, you acknowledge that there indeed might be some really interesting relationships here. You don't have much to say about them because you don't know about that person yet or that event yet. And then you ask them, what do you think the connections are between these things? And then you've made a connection, right? And you can, can continue that conversation with that person later on in the conference, perhaps. Or you can maybe get some suggestions for reading from them about that topic. And finally, make sure you follow up with people who offer productive questions or comments. If someone comes up to you after the presentation and tells you, wow, your paper was really great. I really liked this part, or it made me think about this. Get their contact info, email them. Follow them on Twitter, follow them on Instagram, make a Facebook friend, stay in contact with them. That's how you build community through these things. Okay, and finally, how do you avoid going broke in all of this? So as I mentioned, and as no doubt you've experienced, if you've ever gone to a conference or watched somebody else prepare for a conference, you know that conferences can get very expensive. 
But there are ways to go to conferences, to participate in conferences, to get the community building um, and intellectual inspiration aspect of conferences without totally draining your bank account, I promise. And it starts with being choosy about the conferences that you attend and embracing being a student, right? Oftentimes graduate students are so eager to not be students that they embrace a certain misunderstood vision of a faculty life. But I'm here to encourage you to embrace the student aspect of your identity at this point, particularly when it comes to finances. You can get away with stuff as a graduate student that you just can't as a faculty member, and it saves you a lot of money. So I encourage you to embrace that. So let's start with funding. How do you actually pay to go to conferences? Conferences obviously require conference registration fees, so you pay to attend the conference. Sometimes conferences require you to be a member to attend the conference of the association, and most require you to be a member of the association to present at a conference, so that's a registration fee, or sorry, a conference registration fee and, a mem and an association membership fee, two separate fees. There's obviously transportation costs. How do you physically get there? There's lodging costs. Where do you stay? Where do you sleep? There's food costs, right? How do you feed yourself while you're there? There's often clothes costs. So get how do you uh, how do you buy professional clothes that are appropriate for the particular event or conference that you're attending? Um, and there's sometimes printing costs, right? So printing your paper, printing if you're going to a conference for a job interview, printing your application materials, stuff like that, right? Okay, so where do you find funding for these things? A lot of universities, not all, but a lot of them, provide campus grants. Not all of them, again, but do some serious research about your on your campus to see what travel grants are available to graduate students. Some might be available through your department, so maybe your department offers graduate student travel grants to go to conferences. Maybe there's a dean's grant for graduate student travel. There might be um, a research office graduate student travel grant. If your university has a graduate student association, they sometimes offer travel grants for graduate students. There might be, if you have um, uh, like student service organizations and offices, like a women's center or an LGBT center um, or an African-American student center, they often offer travel grants for graduate students. So look under every rock, ask around, talk to fellow graduate students, talk to faculty, talk to staff, and see where are the little bits of money around campus. Most of the time, you'll be piecing together little bits of money from multiple places, right? There's no single location that's gonna give you all the money you need to go to all your conferences. It's gonna require piecing together little bits of money from here and there, right? Oftentimes, professional associations or the organizations putting conferences on offer some type of uh, student scholarship. This isn't the case with all conferences, obviously, particularly for professional and industry conferences. They don't usually offer that at all. But sometimes the more well-funded, um, more financially secure scholarly associations do offer either travel grants or stipends or some bit of money towards graduate student um, presence to ensure that graduate students can come and can present their work. Apply for all that stuff. You can also think about frequent flyer or reward miles, right? Do you have a, do you have a credit card that has those things? Do you have frequent flyer miles through a particular airline? Do you, are you a member of a, one of the like hotel reward systems or can you be, right? That stuff can add up. And it can be really helpful to at least get you some amount of funding towards a trip. It might not pay for the whole thing, but a few hundred bucks off, that's pretty good, right? Okay, so transportation. Think about some of the cheaper options. Obviously, the one that probably is going to first come to mind is flying to a conference. And, and for some conferences, that will be the necessary one. For example, if you currently live in the United States and you're going to a conference in Japan, you are going to have to fly there. Um, I mean, I suppose technically there are, you could like get on a boat or something, but that would take forever. And I don't think you have the time if you're an academic to do that. 
Um, so you're probably going to have to fly to some types of conferences. And sometimes flying can be the cheaper option. It depends. But those super cheap flights, the ones that, um, you know, aren't terrible, are getting fewer and fewer these days. So instead, think about cheaper options like trains. Is there an Amtrak you can take? Is there a local train or a subway? Buses can often be super cheap if you, if you book ahead of time. You could drive to conferences if you, if you have access to a car and a license. Also think about ride sharing. Are there other people in your program or on campus or that you know in the area that are going to the same conference or even the same area, right? You can, you can organize a carpool. Lodging options. Sometimes uh, scholarly conferences happen in a hotel. They take place in a conference hotel and they often give discounts for people attending those conferences so that you get a conference discount rate on the hotel rooms in that hotel, right? Check out that rate. See if it's something that, that you could do, see if it's reasonable, but also check out some other lodging options. Sometimes that is the cheapest option if they get a really good rate, but sometimes it's not, right? So think about uh, lodging options in terms of Airbnbs that you either get by yourself or that you split with some friends or colleagues going to the same place. You can also split rooms with friends or you know folks from your grad school cohort or people that you know in some capacity. Think about local friends you have in the area. Is there, do you know somebody who lives nearby the conference you're attending that you could stay with? Sometimes conferences, particularly ones that are used to having a lot of graduate students and are very thoughtful about accessibility, oftentimes those organizers can organize homestays. So these are usually graduate students, not always, but usually graduate students in the area where the conference is taking place who agree to put up a graduate student speaker in their house. And sometimes those are organized through the individual people who are offering up their homes. Sometimes it's organized through the conference itself, but it's never, uh, it's never a bad idea to ask, particularly if you're going to a conference that has a lot of graduate students. Right? And then also check out other local hotels. Sometimes the conference hotel is the cheapest option. Sometimes it's wildly not. So make sure you check out other hotels in the area. Food. I mentioned this briefly earlier, but think about how you can minimize food, food costs. Obviously, you can pack food, right? And I strongly encourage that. Even if you're not packing all of the food you're going to be eating for the whole event, pack some, right? Pack uh, your favorite granola bars, your favorite snacks, or whatever it is for you. Pack your favorite um, uh, breakfast stuff if it's portable, right? Research nearby food. So what are restaurants or grocery stores, which is an overlooked thing that I strongly encourage. What are the grocery stores or bodegas or restaurants nearby the conference or nearby where you're staying that you can get cheaper food? Also check out free food, right? Um, as a graduate student, you're probably pretty familiar with where you could get free food on your campus. Think about that at conferences too. Is there a reception that you could go to for 20 minutes to grab some snacks? That might be worth it, right? And then obviously you can split checks with people um, if, you're, if you're there with, with folks. In terms of clothes, um, think about this. Oftentimes uh, graduate students get nervous about uh, not having professional clothes or you're in the process of building a professional wardrobe, whatever that means to you, right? Um, and obviously that can get expensive, but there are ways to minimize that or at least uh, maximize the, the types of clothes that, that are necessary for the specific um, professional life that you're trying to build, right? Think about clothes that will last. So things that won't fall apart tomorrow, right? A really snazzy shirt or a really snazzy suit or a really snazzy bag or something that is gonna last like two months, but looks really cool might not be, and is slightly cheaper, that might not be the best investment over the thing that will last two years, but costs a little bit more, right? So it's a cost benefit kind of thing. On the other hand, if you don't have cash right now, maybe that cheaper option is the better option for you right now. So it depends on your situation, right? But think about it in the long term, not just the short term. You can also obviously borrow or share professional clothes with friends. This can be really helpful um, if you have good friends who are also in graduate school with you and you are of 
similar similar nests such that you could or would want to share professional clothes, that could be really helpful. In terms of printing costs, consider digital versions of things, right? Oftentimes people uh, feel that they have to print out their presentation if they're giving a paper. You don't. You can read it from your laptop. You can read it from your iPad. You can read it from your phone if you want to, right? That's saving printing costs. Conference programs, right? Sometimes conferences will provide printed programs. That's really nice in some contexts, but increasingly they're cutting that as a, as a cost saving measure. And you have the option of either, <coughs> excuse me, printing that yourself or downloading it to a phone that you can keep in your pocket or a tablet that you can carry on you or your computer itself, right? Same with job materials, consider digital versions. It's cheaper, it's easier in some contexts, um, and it, saves, it is better for the environment in that case. All of this adds up to consider the total cost of these various things and weigh it against other needs. So for, what does this mean? So for example, let's say you find a really cheap bus situation that will get you to the conference for like 10 bucks. You're like, sweet versus the $250 uh, uh, plane ticket. You might be inclined to go with a $10 bus trip, right? But think holistically, how long is that bus trip gonna take versus the plane ride? How and what are the other costs involved in that? For example, if the bus ride takes 12 hours and the plane ride takes three, you're probably gonna need to eat some time during that bus ride, right? Can you bring food or are you gonna have to pay for food in that? That's an added cost on top of that $10 bus fare, right? Can you wear your professional clothes on the bus for 12 hours? Probably not gonna wanna, right? Because, you know, after a 12 hour bus ride, no one's feeling particularly fresh. So then you need another outfit to bring, to wear on the bus, right? What kind of luggage situation does the bus allow, right? That can, that can impact whether the bus is the best option. What, what is the schedule for the buses versus the plane, right? Is the bus uh, leaving at a time that's gonna require you to stay an additional night? That adds the lodging cost onto that $10 bus ticket. The bus situation in this example might be the cheaper option but it might not be once you add all those things up, right? So consider the t how these things interact with each other, the kind of holistic interaction of all this, the total cost, not just each individual thing by itself. And then weigh that against your needs. For example, if you know that whenever you take a, uh, whenever you take a flight that flies you in the morning of a conference and you basically have to get off the plane and walk into the conference and present. If you know that that stresses you out, if you know that you don't perform very well in that context, you know that you need way more coffee before you're ready, then maybe flying in the night before, ponying up for the extra night in the hotel can be better for you. That's assuming that fits with your finances. And that's assuming that, that those things weigh against each other. But I'm just encouraging to you to think about holistically what's best for your needs and what's best for your budgets. Okay, so I'm gonna try to stop sharing that and come back maybe, how do we do this? Could just change their interface. Ah, okay. Um, are there questions about conferences or maybe um, tips or tactics that you've learned over the course of your conference going years that, that folks would benefit from? Okay. Well, if you come up with any questions about conferences or you have a conference coming up and you want some feedback, 
on your your plans, maybe your personalized schedule that you've made, or you're trying to decide which events to go to or which conferences to apply to. You can always talk with the Rockstar coaches in Slack, either in our office hours, or you can just ping us at any time and we'll get back to you uh, the next time that we're in Slack. I hope this has been helpful for you and you're planning out your fall conference uh, uh, schedule as well as your however you're approaching conferences in the future. Um, our next webinar is coming up September 6th, and that is open to the public. So please invite anyone you know who is interested in uh, learning about how to rock your first semester in graduate school. So particularly if you know any incoming graduate students, people who are just starting, um, or maybe even people who are in just about to start their second year, but could still use some tips on, on the early years of graduate school, please invite them to us. It's open to the public. It's free. Um, it's September 6th. And you can register for it on our events page at ideasonfire.net slash events. And I'll put the thoughts I'll put the link in the chat room. There we go. Okay. So I hope you can join us then. Otherwise, have a fabulous rest of your August, and I will see you shortly, like in a day, um, in Slack.